Hare Krishna and good evening dear devotees. Thank you for joining us for episode 8 of the Mini Moons podcast. Tonight we are having Chitta Shakti as our guest speaker and she's going to speak about the many faces of Lord Nishingadev. As many of you might remember, it was Lord Nishingadev's appearance day just last Sunday and it's one of the prominent festivals which we celebrate in ISKCON. And many of us might know Lord Nishingadev as the very uh, ferocious avatar that came specifically to save um, his very dear Pallodi Pallad. But there are also many other aspects of Lord Nishingadev which we might not be so familiar with. So tonight, Chuti Shakti um, is going to enlighten us about the other many more faces of Lord Nishingadev. So Chuti Shakti, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. I know you're very enthusiastic to enlighten us more about Lord Nishingadev. And she also shared with us that she'd like to open up the session by singing the prayers that we sing in glorification to Lord Nishingadev. Thank you so much, Sharadia and Dee. It's so nice to be with you again. Uh, I don't know if I can enlighten anyone. Actually, for me, it's been a, a great purification and learning uh, to actually understand Lord Nishingadev. But yes, like, um, like you mentioned, I think let's start with uh, prayers to Lord Nishingadev because... He is a complex personality, and uh, I know there can often be a lot of confusion around how we should approach him. And really, it's only by his mercy that we can approach him. Uh, it's not Approaching the Lord is not something that we can mentally uh, create or conjecture, but by his grace. So um, those of you listening at home, please join in at home, uh, and we'll just sing the Nishinga the prayers. Namaste Narasinghaya Namaste Narasinghaya Bella Bella Dadai Bella Bella Dadai Eranya Kashi Hiranya Kashi Puvaksha Shila Tanka Nakalai Shila Tanka Nakalai Hitana Shinga Parata Nishinga Hitana Shinga Parata Nishinga Yatoya toya mita to nishinga Yatoya toya mita to nishinga
Wishing a day of Pagwan aqui, Jeff. Thank you so much, um, Chacha Shakti Prabhu, for leaving us in the prayers. I think now we have invoked both the presence and the blessings of Lord Nishengadev. And as many of us might know, that that, that prayer is a standard part of the ISKCON morning program. Um, we would sing it in our ISKCON temples every morning, and often it's also sung after many other programs, like the Sunday Feast program. We also often sing these prayers before we sing the Prashadam prayers and take um, prashadam. But what is interesting is that the worship of, of Lord Nishingadev is not present in all, you know, Vaishnava congregations, and it actually wasn't present right from the start within ISKCON. So it is interesting that Prabhupada did introduce it only a couple of years after ISKCON had been established. So Chaitanya Shakti Prabhu, could you explain to us why Prabhupada introduced the worship of Lord Nishingadev? as mm -hmm. an official part of our every morning day program. You know, what Prabhupada was doing was very pioneering to, to bring um, Vaishnavism, which is Sanatana Dharma, available to everybody regardless of caste, color, and creed, to be able to give something so sacred, so deep, um, to anyone and everyone. It's not an easy task. You know, he had uh, many obstacles, uh, physical uh, obstacles which were brought on by other sampradayas, other groups, even within his own God family. There were people who were putting up barriers because to give something so valuable freely can disturb people who maybe feel it's their entitlement, their right, or feel that it should only be distributed amongst a certain few. Uh, and plus, as we know, in Kali Yuga, we're walking uphill. We're swimming upstream. You know, the, the age, the nature of the age is against us. So Srila Prabhupada knew this. He knew it would not be an easy task. Um, he, of course, surrendered to the blessings and empowerment of his spiritual master. But when we surrender to the blessings and empowerment of Guru, we also have to apply our intelligence to see what can I do which tools has the spiritual master, which tools has Krishna sent that I can make my fulfillment of the instruction easier, make it go more smoothly? So, you know, I think before we really get into more about why Srila Prabhupada would, would have wanted to and did introduce the worship of Lord Nishingadeva, which primarily was for protection, primarily for protection of devotees, because he knew there would be attacks on him personally, on the devotees at the time and in years to come. As this gets stronger, as spiritual life becomes more prevalent, so the attacks initially will, um, you know, increase. Uh, it's just like when you have a cold, right, or you have a virus. Sometimes uh, what happens is when you first start treating it, the virus fights back even more. It multiplies even quicker. To fight back. So we also see this in spiritual life. So Srila Prabhupada wanted to invoke and have the presence of one of Krishna's many faces. Okay, Krishna's, yes, he's the supreme personality of Godhead. He is all attractive and he is attracted to all. And so because he is attracted to all, he also shows other sides of himself and makes them more prominent at certain times and hides them at certain times, depending on what the purpose is. So Narsingha Dev actually means uh, Narsingha is lion, right? Lion. So Narsingha Dev is a manifestation of uh, Krishna where he is half man and half lion. And actually his appearance is really speaks to this potency or purpose of protection. And we could spend the whole hour discussing the seventh canto and the pastime of uh, Prahlad Maharaj and Lord Nishingadev. But actually, who, who is it that invokes his presence? Who is it that invites Lord Nishingadev's presence into this world? It's a little boy. Now, normally when you think about Lord Nishingadev, you think about a lie, half man, half lion. Isn't that going to be something that's scary to a child? Right. But it's this form that actually comes to protect Prahlad Maharaj. Now, Prahlad Maharaj, he uh, was a great devotee from birth, um, but he was born into a family of demons. Now, it's interesting because 
if we read Srimad Bhagavatam, and when we often hear about demons and devotees, we often base it on, okay, demon is someone who has a particular physical type, you know, they don't, they're not so nice to look at, um, you know, whereas devotional divine beings and heavenly beings are really nice to look at and opulent and calm and saintly. Um, but actually, if we read Srimad Bhagavatam, what we find and we look at even pastimes of Lord Ram, like, for example, Ravan, we look at Gans, and we look at Hiranyakashipur, who is the father of Prahlad Maharaj. They're actually very learned, very learned. Uh, they had great expertise in Vedic literature, but they used divine opulence and divine sacred knowledge to just gratify their senses. Hiranyakashipur actually really means gold and soft bed. Those were his two uh, biggest attachments. Opulence as money, Lakshmi as good fortune, and then women, soft bed. So um, he was intoxicated with this. And on this theme of demons, so demons can also be a race. So demon isn't just about consciousness, it can also be a race. So how is it that Prahlad Maharaj took birth in a, uh, you know, demonic circumstance? Actually, you know, we'll get into a bit more when we speak about Prahlad Maharaj, but what's wonderful is that devotion can be found anywhere. You know, this is the way we see that bhakti prevails and wins over everything, as it doesn't matter what the environment, the atmosphere is. So anyway, um, Hiranya Kashipur, he was so antagonistic to Vishnu because Vishnu previously as Varahadeva had killed his brother Hiranyaksha in his Bore incarnation, in his third incarnation of the Das Avatar. And he was very angry. Even though he knew that Vishnu is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he was envious. He didn't want him to have all the worship because he was really angry that he'd hurt his brother, he'd killed his brother. And so as he became intoxicated with his own opulence, with his own pride, with his own control, he was really creating havoc. And he wanted everybody in his kingdom to be trained to worship him. Now, Prahlad Maharaj being attached to the Lord from birth, would he, you know, even though he was in his own guruku, you know, le <laughs> learning sacred texts, but also learning to worship his father, he would preach to the elder, other children, he would glorify the Lord, they would have their little kirtans, he would even sometimes, you know, turn the minds of his teachers and turn the hearts of his teachers. And so his father became very angry because he couldn't tolerate it. You know, he expected his own to worship him. And so he made many attempts on his life. And every time he made an attempt on Prahlad Maharaj's life, Prahlad Maharaj didn't retaliate, he didn't fight back. In fact, Prahlad Maharaj was always a perfect child in that he never answered back in a arrogant tone. He never behaved as if he knew better. He simply would try to get his father to understand what's going on, you know, why he worships Lord Vishnu. And so when the attacks would come, he would just pray. He would pray for protection. And in so many unusual ways, protection would come. Always, if you read the Parsons, they're beautiful, you know, beautiful. Uh, the Lord would change the serpents within their heart and they wouldn't attack uh, Prahlad Maharaj. You know, the Lord caught him himself when he was thrown off a cliff. You know, just really amazing transcendental pastimes. So finally, there was the last straw. Hiranya Kashipur had had enough. He just couldn't understand how he couldn't defeat a small boy. And so he challenged him. He said, okay, so you say Vishnu can do anything. Vishnu is present everywhere, including, you know, in everyone's heart. So where is he now? Who's going to protect you? Are you would, is he in this pillar? So Lord Nishing there, Prahlad Maharaj has so much faith. He has so much faith. And he has faith based on experience, you know, real connection. This is, it's from this pillar that Lord Nishingadev manifests, this half man, half lion. And, and the amazing, one of the other amazing things actually about Lord Nishingadev, this manifestation of Krishna, is not just the compassion he shows to Prahlad Maharaj, but the compassion he shows to Hiranyakashipur and the compassion he shows to Brahma. Uh, now, why Brahma? So um, Hiranyakashipur actually often people wonder, well, why couldn't Hiranyakashipur be killed by any of the demigods? Why couldn't somebody else destroy him? Why did the Lord have to come himself? Now, because of his great penances, he was offered a boon. And the boon he asked for originally was immortality. Now, of course, Brahma can't give immortality. Um, he's mortal himself. And so the prayer was, and the request was modified. And you know, many conditions are placed. No one from land, no one from sea, no human being. Um, 
not at, in daytime, not at nighttime, not inside, not outside. So, you know, Hirani Kashipuru thought he'd covered all bases. <laughs> so like I said, I'm so smart. I've covered all bases. There's no way anyone can get me. And so Krishna didn't want to break Prama's promise. Krishna also wanted to be kind to his devotees and he wanted to protect Prahlad Maharaj, but he also wanted to free Hirani Kashipur because Hirani Kashipur and Hirani Aksha are um, Jay and Vijay, his gatekeepers. He wanted to have their time, you know, on earth, complete, wound up, finished as soon as possible. And so there are many layers to this pastime. Krishna shows compassion and kindness. And of course, because he's perfect, and he's perfectly kind to everybody in every perfect way. He finds a way. So as Lord Nishingadev, he comes as a half animal, half human. He doesn't come in the daytime. He doesn't come at night. He comes at twilight. And he doesn't destroy Hiranyakashipur inside or outside. He destroys him in a doorway. And he doesn't, you know, destroy him on the ground or in the air or in the sea. He puts him on his lap. And so, you know, we see in this, in these many ways, in this many faceted, multifaceted manifestation and purpose that Krishna comes with, that uh, he really covers all bases. And so Srila Prabhupada was invoking this, not just a general protection, but a multifaceted protection, a dynamic protection, a protection that protects everybody involved, the attacker as well as the victim. Because Prabhupada knew that Actually, ultimately, real spiritual life means that everybody benefits. And so by invoking Lord Nishingadev's presence, although on the surface it may seem harsh and violent, actually everybody's protected, even those who are attacking. So this is why he introduced the Nishingadev prayers. Thank you so much, um, Prabhu, for summarizing um, the, the past time of Lord Nishingadev with Prahlad Maharaj, one thing that really um, stood out to me as you were narrating the story is that whenever Krishna does anything, I mean, he achieves many goals, you know, with one action. Like in this instance, you know, he's appearing to save Prahlad and to also, you know, show um, his dedication and his affection, you know, for his devotee. Like he came just for that one devotee, like manifested a whole form. And at the same time, he, he did, um, you know, relieve the demigods and the universe of Iranya Kashipu's tyranny. At the same time, he also liberated um, Iranya Kashipu and he satisfied his own need, you know, for, for having some chivalry and having some 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 fighting. So it's, it's fascinating. And I, I just a short reflection I had on that is sometimes if something happens in our own lives, we see it like from only one perspective, you know, like there's some, something, maybe something difficult happens and we see that there's only one cause for it and there's, it is like one thing that we're focusing on. But actually, I think it's nice to meditate upon how when the Lord makes something happen, he's actually achieving multiple of his, you know, divine goals and have that faith that, you know, as you said, if if, if we, um, for instance, pray for Lord Nushingadev, it's beneficial for everyone. You know, his presence is beneficial for everyone. So we can trust that um, whether we pray to not Nishingadev and he makes things happen in our life or Krishna, it's going to be beneficial all, you know, all around, in all directions and on all, on all levels. So yeah, one no, thing we, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 so we no, mentioned no. that, you know, one of the reasons that Prabhupada introduced the worship of Lord Narasimhadev is, is to invoke that protection, not just for devotees, but everybody. Was there any other reasons that we didn't cover, apart from protection, why we actually pray to Narasimhadev? Because the obvious mm -hmm. reason would be protection, right? But is there anything else that, uh, any other reason, external or internal factors, as to why we uh, pray to Lord Narasimha? So, um I was just thinking it would be nice to go through the translation of the Nishingadev prayers that we started with. So yeah. I'll read the English translation. So I offer my obeisances to Lord Nishinga, who gives joy to Prahlad Maharaj, and whose nails are like chisels on the stone-like chest of demon Haranyakashipur. Lord Nishinga is here and also there. Wherever I go, Lord Nishingadev is there. He is within the heart and he is outside as well. I surrender to Lord Nishingadev the origin of all things and the supreme refuge. O Keshav, O Lord of the universe, 
O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of half man, half lion, all glories to you. Just as one can easily crush a wasp between one's fingernails, so in the same way the body of the wasp-like demon Hiranika Shapur has been ripped apart by the wonderful pointed nails on your beautiful lotus hands. So just within this translation, um, three things really stand out. You know, one is that he gives joy to Prahlad Maharaj. And, and Krishna explains this uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, that uh, he comes for three reasons, re-establish religious principles, destroy the demons, but also to please the devotees. So we pray to Nishingadev for pleasure as well. You know, he's he's got many forms, many faces, many manifestations, which we'll speak about a bit later. But actually, when when we trust the hand behind whatever comes to us, then even if the appearance is ferocious, it's welcome. It feels safe. Um, that pain can even feel comforting or their appearance can feel comforting. It's like when you're in distress, if the police come, you feel comforted, right? You're not scared of someone in a police car or in a you know policeman's uniform. You feel comfort. So there's, there's a joy, there's a pleasure. And actually, if we look at uh, Nishingadev's pastimes and his conversation and dialogue and the prayers that he has with Prahlad Maharaj afterwards, they're actually very sweet, very, very sweet. Um, so yes, there's a there's there's many internal and external reasons. So as well as protection, there's the pleasure we get from singing Lord Nishingdev's names, looking at his beautiful face, uh, that makes us feel safe. Uh, and there are, you know, we're all going to have a different affinity to maybe a different appearance because there are different appearances of Nishingdev depending on where in the past time we meet him. Um, we also have surrender. So this whole mood of you know the same way we um i surrender to lord nishinga the origin of all things and supreme refuge so what does surrender mean surrender means that i will allow you to protect me in my most vulnerable state but just like he removes hiranyakashipur from prahlad Maharaj's life where is the hiranyakashipur within all of us who is the hiranyakashipur within all of us you know we were talking about this mood of our understanding the demon and the devotee. Now, there's a, a verse in Bhagavatam that talks about where demons and devotees live. Then in Satya, demons and devotees lived on different planets. In Treta Yuga, they live on the same planet, but in different countries. In Dvarpa Yuga, they live in the same country, but in different cities. But in Kali Yuga, they live within the same person. So, you know, we can look around us on this planet um, and... I don't think we'll come across a demon quite like Hiranyakashipur, but what are the things that really dictate whether Hiranyakashipur is a demon or not? What's this demonic consciousness? Demonic consciousness means to take every gift I have and to just enjoy it for myself, even at the expense of others. That's demonic consciousness, where the beneficiary is just me, even if everybody else loses. Whereas selflessness and divine consciousness is the beneficiary is everybody else, and particularly Krishna, even if it's at my expense. So it's a, the complete opposite. So our internal reasons for praying to Nishingadev is really about <clears throat> removing our internal obstacles. From time to time, we'll need protection externally. But that's more from time to time. You know, I know different devotees have got different material circumstances or external circumstances. But for most of us, um, For most of us, um, uh, for most of us, our challenges are more internal, uh, and it's the internal obstacles that we need to uh, remove. So, yeah, we protect. Sometimes we need protection from ourselves, from our own minds, from our own egos, and the things that intoxicate us into thinking that even sometimes the things that we get as a side effect of devotional service uh, are there for us to enjoy, when actually they're really to offer back in service. 
I think that leads on to a point that you said it's about, you know, getting rid of that demonic consciousness that we have within ourselves, you know, that internal reason. And it, you'd often also hear Lord Nazimba uh, kind of linked to the person that uh, the Lord in charge of Anartha Nivati. So that's the, you know, kind of uh, liberation from material contamination. So why is that um, Lord Nazimba is also considered as the presiding deity of Anartha Nivati? Hmm. Um, actually, you know, the, <laughs> when we're looking at Lord Nishingadev being a presiding deity, what is a presiding deity? Presiding deity means that face of Krishna which is taking charge of a particular aspect. And Anartha Nivriti means removal of unwanted things. So when we're talking about unwanted things, we're talking about all the obstacles within us that block us from surrendering. Uh, it primarily starts with misidentification with the body and mind as the self. And then that's the root of so many things like fear, greed, envy, lust, etc. Things which lead to really weakness of heart, cause us unsteadiness in our practice, cause us to slow down and not receive the full benefit. Um, so Lord Nishingadev actually has great potency if we'll allow him to to help us to remove these unwanted things because as well as removing them we also asking him to remove them we have to also be willing to let them go right we can, we can say to someone please take this case from me but if we're still holding on to it they can't actually take it away um and also lord nishingadev's worship's been there for a long time if you look at uh krishna leela for example gargamuni actually advises Yashoda and um, and uh, Nanda Maharaj to worship Lord Nishingadev for protection, for protection of for the protection of Krishna. <laughs> so even Krishna uses his many forms to, uh, you know, appear in his own pastimes. And um, it's interesting, if you look at the mood of Lord Nishingadev, that he's protective to Prahlad Maharaj. And in that protection, he can become ferocious. What mood is that? That's pretty parental. And actually, we know from the um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the nectar of devotion, that he's also the presiding deity of Vatsalya Ras, this mood of parental love, which interestingly so makes sense then that you show that Nanda Maharaj are worshipping Nishingadev in their own home. So he's considered the presiding deity of Anartha Nivriti because he will, he'll remove things and he will remove, like we were saying earlier, he will remove things in such a way that it's compassionate and caring to all. We can't predict how he'll do it. You know, I know sometimes devotees get a bit nervous. They're like, oh, you know, I don't want to worship Nishingadev because I've heard he takes away everything. But Nishingadev is compassionate because actually he's ultimately Krishna. So he's not going to take away everything unless we're ready for it, right? He will take things away in a way that we can manage, in a way that we can digest, in a way that is doable. And also removing everything is not about removing everything externally. There's, If you look at the word everything, everything could be quantitative, like lots of things, or it could be qualitative, as in what's your everything? Where have you invested most meaning? Right? Just like Prabhupada says, you know, uh, um, a sadhu can just be attached to his one uh, water pot, right? So to that sadhu, that water pot is their everything. You can have everything, you know, many, many things, and out of those many things, what's your everything? It could be a person, it could be a particular aspect of your status, it could be an object. Krishna is likely going to take away whatever it is that you are investing most of your time and energy in, aside from him especially if it's not helpful in your spiritual life. And so we can, you know, we can look to Nishingadev to help us with these removal of unwanted things, because actually if we are rigorously introspective, we don't have to wait for Nishingadev or Krishna to remove things in a harsh way. We'll already have a sense of, okay, well, actually, you know, I've noticed I am putting more energy, more mental energy, more time in this particular area of my life and neglecting my spiritual life. So how can I regain the balance? And so in this way, we're already showing him I'm ready to let go. And so then he facilitates. Someone has to pull a lot less harder if we're already letting go. If we're holding tight, they pull really hard, right? So he doesn't have to pull so hard. I had one, well, I, I have um, at home, I have uh, Pralad Nishinga, and Lord Nishinga, they're sitting in uh, his, you know, 
uh, yoga asan where he's holding his conch disc and uh, club and with his right hand he's blessing Prahlad Maharaj and he's sitting on Anantashesh. And I remember when back in 2005, so I was given this particular deity during Pachitirta Maharaj's, you know, final few months. I remember going to ask him, uh, you know, if I had permission to worship Lord Nishinkan. And I remember when I asked him, he looked at me very, very gravely, very gravely. I thought, oh my God, he's going to say no. <laughs> you know, did you? He looked really serious at me. He said, Do you want to worship Nishinkan? And he just looked for a long time. And he said, okay, we can worship him. He said, and. Uh, whenever you have any nonsense in your mind and in your heart, you place your head in the Shingadev's lap, meditate on placing your head in the Shingadev's lap and surrender to allowing him to using his sharp nails to tear that nonsense away. So we can, you know, for, for me, I felt like I he gave me a very nice blessing um, to actually have a very clear meditation on how to engage with Lord Shingadev uh, in the mood of trying to remove obstacles. And it's something I still use to this day. Thank you so much um, for sharing all of that. There's so many, <laughs> there's so many points um, that I felt was really um, powerful. And But you, you can now correct me if I am um, not understanding this clearly. But one thing that I, I found fascinating about you know, Lord Nishingadev and his um, relationship with Prahlad is that, you know, usually in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, um, when we talk about um, the parental ras, it's it's usually, you know, the devotees who are being parental towards Krishna. But what I found fascinating about Lord Nishingadev is that if you look at him and Prahlad, he's like the parent, you know, in that relationships. He takes on that parental role. He's like the protector and when I think about Nishingadev, I think about him as like a dad. You know, he's like, he's like so fatherly. Like in his ferocious form, I still feel like he's dad. He's just angry dad. But for me, that's like, that's that's the role that I see. But then if you, if you meditate upon the, the role of a parent and the role of the parent is simultaneously the protection of the child, but it's also molding the child. I mean, as, you know, as a child, you're, the parent is the main person who is, you know, telling you off for doing things that are going to be harmful for you, correcting you, disciplining you. But the motivation is always love. You know, it's always, um, you know, to shape you, you know, into a virtuous um, human being. So I find that, you know, for me, it makes complete sense that he's both, you know, he's both the protector and he is, um, he is the one that's guiding us. So he has to, he has to also, yeah, he has to also be the one then that corrects us. Yeah, such a nice realization. That's a really nice way to put it, that he is molding us. And Artha Nivriti is part of our process of being molded, being remolded back to our original state, right? Shedding the things that are unnecessary, uh, that we have um, acquired, you know, those things that we have, the baggage we've picked up that we don't need. You know, a parent will lovingly sort through the child's school bag. <laughs> they go, yeah, you don't really need this. <laughs> Let's get rid of it. Um you might want a bit, few more pencils, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, that's a really nice reflection. I like how you how, how you um, frame that. That uh, there's this aspect also that Narada Nirvati is about being molded. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, but what fascinates me also about Nishingadev, I mean, there's so many things, is that somehow you know worshiping him is also directly you know connected to the worship of Radha Krishna and as, you know, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, our goal, you know, of developing very specifically um, Vraj Bhakti. And I wasn't, you know, aware of this direct connection between the worship of Nord Shingadev and the worship between Radha Krishna until I read some of the prayers of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And in his Sri Navadvi Bhava Taranga, he writes um, five verses to Lord Nishingadev. And in the fourth verse, um, Lord Nishingadev is actually like, you know, responding to the prayers of the devotee. And then Lord Nishingadev says to his devotee, Dear child, sit down freely and live happily here in Shigurangadam. May you nicely worship the divine couple and may you develop loving attachment for their holy names. By the mercy of my devotees, all obstacles are cast far away with a purified heart. Just perform the worship of Radha and Krishna. For such, 
for such worship overflows with sweet nectar. So could you elaborate what is the relationship between the worship of Motlushingadev and achieving our goal, which is, you know, service towards Radha Krishna? I mean, it follows very naturally from where we left off in terms of this mood of being molded. Uh, by having uh, internal and external obstacles removed. Actually, Paktimino Thakur and Paktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur did introduce the worship of Lord Nishingadev into a Gaudiya Math, anyway, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Um, and so it, it, this is reflected in Paktimino Thakur's prayers. Uh, so we can't progress towards Prema with all this baggage. So it's actually very mm -hmm. significant, it's very important. You know, we, we know from the first verse of the Shikshastakam Chitra Darpana Marjanam, you know, that we're cleansing the holy name, Harinam Sankirtan, cleanses the heart of the dust accumulated over millions of lifetimes, right? Which stops us from seeing that pure image of our true self. And we and as a, with our true self, we are nothing unless we are connected in divine love. Uh, and we have Rajpati. So in the process of doing that, it's it's essential that we clean the heart but to connect with the holy names properly we must also be being molded because if we look at the anarthas what is the main thing that the anarthas get in the way of the main thing the anarthas get in the way of is before we even get to a point of knowing who we are they get in the way of just us being able to connect with the holy name you know, when we think of chant, you know, when we understand chanting, when we understand Haridas Thakur's elaboration in Harinam Chintamani of the different stages of chanting, we have the Nama Parad stage, which is offensive chanting. And offensive chanting is like shooting ourselves in the foot. We're doing the, you know, we've got the right instrument, but we're, you know, you might have the best knife, but you end up stabbing yourself with it. Right. Uh, and then the next stage is Nama Pass. And in many ways, Nama Pass can happen in two ways. It's, it's, um, the incidental Nama Pass, where somebody doesn't really know what they're chanting, but they're enjoying it, they're liking it. Often like when we go on Harinam, you know, people might join in because they like the music. They're so free-hearted, they don't know what they're saying, but they're being offenseless. And so because they're being offenseless, they're actually getting more benefit. You know, they're, they're, it's almost like having a knife and by fluke doing the right thing with it, you just end up chopping the vegetables. <laughs> wow, this is really good, you know. Um, but as devotees, we want to move away from Nama Parad, you know, making offenses, being in, especially being inattentive. Because this is that Anarthas, going back to this point of where's my everything, who's my everything, what's my everything. So wherever our attention is diverted to, that is usually what crops up in our chanting, doesn't it? When we're chanting, that, where, that which we're most attached to or most averse to is what comes up in our mind, where our greatest worries or our greatest desires lie. So we can often start, with Nama Pass, unknowingly chanting enthusiastically. And then after a little while of practicing, we, because of our narthas, we go back to Nama Parat. So we want to move at least to Nama Pass, where we are chanting with consistent endeavor to bring our mind, intentional Nama Pass, shadow chanting, intentional, where we can make progress. So we're saying, okay, I know I'm holding the knife and I'm going to practice using it properly. Okay, so I don't hurt myself, but I actually can actually chop enough vegetables that I can make a good, good dish here. You know, and uh, ultimately that leads to actually really understanding uh, the gift that we hold, real pure name, that uh, we can really then, once those obstacles are removed, once there's nothing standing between us and the Lord, then calling his name is non-different to being with him. So Paktivinod Thakur's prayer is a, a follow-on. It's really an elaboration yeah. on the Lord, that on the role that Lord Nishingadev takes in helping us to be molded and reshaped. This might be a little bit of an unconventional comparison, but when you were speaking about, you know, how when we say that Lord Nishingadev will remove everything, how everything can mean multiple things, or more specifically, it can mean that big thing, you know, you know what is our biggest attachment or our biggest desire and it, it made me think of how if you think about this you know archetypal um year's journey that we see in so many stories and, and films then we see that the character to reach its goal which is its destiny it usually it has to overcome or let go of that everything you know that thing that is the everything and i mm -hmm. feel that for, for devotees that 
anarta nivriti phase that we go through it's, it looks very much like the euro's journey because it's like you know struggles and it's like you know you need to like develop certain qualities and it's very much of a, of a phase which you are being still um you know uh, shaped and you have to really grow and i think for us you know that like our, our destiny obviously that we need to attain is radha krishna and it's that you know we have to also then radha shingadev can help us to overcome that everything or let go of that everything and that's our like our yellow's journey is like you know we we, we want to end up there with radha krishna so and yeah, he's like I, the he's like that guide <laughs> in our yellow's journey <laughs> Yeah, a bit like uh, Gandalf. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. If anybody's familiar with that, Gandalf and uh, the Frodo, because <laughs> he yes, needs his friend yes. to stop himself from coming to the power of the ring. Yeah, the hero's yes. journey. And you know, one thing about if we're looking at the analogy of heroes is that often a hero's biggest strengths are also their greatest weaknesses uh, if they're not applied properly. So one has to know the strength mm -hmm. and power they're wielding mm -hmm. in order that it doesn't become a problem. Uh, you know, there's also this aspect of, you know because krishna has so many different aspects for different purposes our journey to really connecting with krishna the person with braj bhakti along that journey it is not unusual in fact it's it's recommended and natural to take shelter of one of his other manifestations or forms you know there are many devotees who for example um will take shelter of dhamandari for health you know, and we often pray to Lord Balaram for strength in our spiritual life. We pray to Lord Balaram, Lord Nityananda, for deeper connection with the Guru. Um, so this this process of being molded, being shaped, happens through our prayer. It happens internally. It happens through associating with devotees, and of course, it happens in the Guru disciple relationship, because serving really serving the spiritual master is uh, like attending a spiritual boot camp. You have to be broken down before you can be remolded. You know, and, and actually, Lord Nishingadev did the same to Prahlad Maharaj. Why didn't he come the first time Prahlad Maharaj was praying and surrendering? Why didn't he come the first time? Um, you know, so um, why? Because he was using Prahlad Maharaj as an example, really, just like, like in the example of Draupadi and Krishna. And um, why doesn't Krishna come straight away when Draupadi is being disrobed? Because she's still holding on tight, right? And then he comes when she eventually surrenders completely. Prahlad Maharaj gets to the point where he's actually face to face with his father before Nishingadev appears. He doesn't come at any other time. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing something in the chat room and I agree with the discussion in the chat room. <laughs> So I think we've touched upon a lot of things around, you know, the ferocious nature of Lord Nasimha and, you know, how he's obviously this, you know, presiding deity of taking all those internal and external obst obstacles away from us, you know, from our pa path to bhakti and for love of Radha and Krishna, sorry, developing love of Radha and Krishna. But there's one prayer to Lord Nasimha that says, you know, although very ferocious, the lioness is very kind to her cubs. Similarly, although very ferocious to non-devotees like Hiranika Shipu, Lord Nasimha Dev is very, very soft and kind to devotees like Prahlad Maharaj. So we also see in that pastime where, you know, once he's slain Hiranika Shipu, he's so fired up and nobody would, would want to go near him to kind of sort of pacify him. And, you know, I think somebody asked Lakshmi and Lakshmi says, no, I, you know, I've never seen Krishna, yeah, I'm not going nowhere near him. And, it's, and then they send little Pralad with his, you know, garland because right, he's yeah. so uh, so loving, and you know they know that Lord and Simi is so. Uh, loving towards little Pr Prahlad and there's also you know the yoga pose you mentioned I've read somewhere that he actually then after slaying Hiranyakashipu he actually disappeared and actually had to do some sort of yoga to kind of really calm himself down because it's it's one of the most kind of ferocious uh, reincarnate you know it's, it's that powerful sort of um, incarnation so people would often see uh, you know this this form with long nails and you know blood 
blood all over the place. So how can you, when you see the depiction in such a ferocious form, how can we then sort of surrender and sort of break down that and connect with the soft and kind-hearted nature, like Sharadia mentioned, like a you know angry dad being very protective towards the kids. So how do we really connect towards that softer side of the Lord? So this is this is why uh, hearing and reading is so important. And you know because you know in the temples we'll have different forms of the Lord, we'll have different paintings of the Lord, and often in the temples we will have the, the that beautiful painting of Lord Nishingadev with blood splattered on his you know lion's mane and Hiranika Shapur on his lap, because in many ways it's very attractive. It's definitely striking. People always ask a question: Oh, we see a beautiful Krishna playing a flute, and this beautiful lady next to him. What's this? <laughs> Who's this? Like, who's this angry lion? So I think hearing and reading is really important, and also using that picture as a way to just explain people that actually we have to take things in context. Right? We have to take things in context. If you've ever seen a mother or father protecting their kids, they don't look pretty. You don't want to see me protecting my daughter. <laughs> I, don't, I don't look pretty. So it's not. It's not because that's not going to invoke any kind of. Um, protection or fear in you know protection of my daughter or fear in the other person they people have to know i'm serious okay they're going to know the person that you're protecting has to know you're serious and the person you're protecting them from has to know that you're serious so how do we as devotees um not get overwhelmed uh by that image of the lord is is understand and this is why we have discussions like this that uh, love has a ferocious side as well that protective side can look ferocious, but how, why is it that Prahlad Maharaj was the only one to, could, to who could pacify him? If you think about it, he was so angry. The only thing he invoked in everybody else, not just the demons, even the demigods, they were scared. You know, Shiva tried to pacify him, Brahma tried to pacify him. They did, just couldn't. They just couldn't. And their words weren't enough. Why? Brahma and Shiva approached him with or in reverence. Prahlad Maharaj approached him with love. And where there is love, there's no space for fear. And where there's no fear, there's no need for Nishingadev to protect anyone. So he can calm down very quickly. So obviously we just touched upon the beautiful pastime that we kind of celebrate during, um, you know, Nasimha Chattandashi. And, you know, we all know this pastime with Lord Nasimha and, and Prahlad Maharaj. Were there any other pastimes uh, we have uh, or that you wanted to share uh, where Lord Nasimha actually manifested to protect his devotees? Mm. I mean, there's so, do you know what? There's so many. We don't even have to look historically. So many have happened in modern times recently, you know. Uh, I know there was a devotee in uh, New York who was being, um, you know, would feel a little bit intimidated from time to time when a group of Harley Davidson motorcyclists would kind of drive past in quite an intimidating way. And anyway, one day they chased him down an alleyway to harass him and he just closed his eyes they backed him into the alley he had nowhere to go he was up against a wall and he said he, he closed his eyes and he prayed and he started chanting the Dev prayers and he was ready to get beaten up or whatever it was they were going to do to him and as he was finishing the prayers he realized no one had done anything to him or touched him and he opened his eyes and no one was there and he went back to the temple the next day they all the men came back this time they came into the temple and they approached him and they said, what is it that you do here? Uh, and they seemed really calm. They said, we're really sorry about yesterday. Uh, when we were about to attack you, a huge lion appeared behind you. And we just freaked out. We don't know what you were saying, but whatever you were saying, that after you said what you said, this, this lion appeared. And so we ran away, but you must be doing something really far out here for you to be able to just say a few words. And, you know, this lion type personality came. So, this is this is modern this is modern day Kali Yuga, you know, uh, Nishingadev appearing uh, in these pastimes. There's also I know Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. He's got this. Uh, he's got a very very beautiful but ferocious form of Ugra Nishinga uh, that he worshipped uh, when he was on the planet. We still have the deity in being worshipped in uh, Institute House, uh, kind of his headquarters in uh, Washington D.C. Really beautiful. 
and but also ferocious you know nishikin has got his sharp teeth he's got his tongue out uh, you can see the garland of intestines around his neck hiranika is kind of lying on his lap and maharaj would go into many dangerous environments in fact he also had a cane which had a nishingadev head on it and he would you know, he was also very pioneering very eclectic uh would reach people and he would often talk about some of the politicians he worked with in some of the countries where the political culture, especially for the leaders, was very much one of exploitation. They weren't really looking after the people uh, who they were serving uh, or who were under their care. Uh, and so he would often go into these environments and spend time with them to try and make some dent in their consciousness. So he describes you know, in one class how he would always position, whatever, whichever room he was staying in, he would position his Nishingadev Diti in such a way that when anybody would come in the room, before they saw him, they would see Nishingadev. And he did this for two, well, a few reasons. The reasons I can remember are, one, that they would get darshan of Lord Nishingadev. Two, Nishingadev was between him and them, so there was always some protection. And three, there was also, it was like a filter, because he saw that those who were very, very demonic in consciousness, said one particular politician, he came in as soon as he saw Nishingadev, he couldn't even stay in the room. He literally, let, he ran away. He ran away. So, you know, Lord Nishingadev is, is there whether we uh, have, uh, you know, whether we call his name and somebody who's attacking us actually sees him or whether through the deity people have a profound experience of feeling protected. Um, I mean, I, I personally have had many experiences where, you know, some of the environments I, I move in are very heavily uh, Influenced by Tamagun, there are, you know, subtle entities, etc. The, the atmosphere can be very thick uh, with this type of energy. Chant Nishingadev prayers and that sound vibration, that is still Lord Nishingadev acting, that's still him present. They just disappear or even meditating on his form, they disappear. Uh, they go away, you know. Um, he puts fear in fear personified, right? So there are, there are many pastimes where... Uh, Lord Nishingadev has protected. Also, we, we know that Lord Nishingadev appears differently in different, you know, our Bhagavatam is our Bhagavatam for our particular age now, right? Uh, for our particular universe, for our particular age. But we also know that in different uh, manifestations, different pastimes, perhaps in other universes, he appears in different ways as well. He doesn't always come from a pillar. Um, you know, there's one pastime that Sachinanda Maharaj sh shares um, where Nishingadev doesn't come from a pillar. He actually comes flying in on Garuda and he kills Hiranyakashipur on his balcony uh, of his palace. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of pastimes. And I, I highly recommend listening to Janani Vas Prabhu and Pankajanvi Prabhu's uh, YouTube videos on uh, pastimes of Lord Nishingadev. And how he's come to protect the devotees, because there there are many many in Mayapur. No, that was very very interesting. You know, the modern day. You know, because we think often. You know, it's always you, you know these deities or Krishna is just in a past time in a book. You know, they existed in a you know long time ago. You know, often you know the thing that we get here. You know, why are you worshiping a deity? They're just a form. You know, there's nothing to it. But you know, the stories like the one you elaborated around. You know, where these devotees was hassled by bikers and you know th these experiences. You know, you can't make these things up. And I know other devotees that have had you know specific problems with the devotional life you know where, where their surrounding or situation wasn't um, you know very helpful to their journey spiritual journey and when they've actually prayed to nothing with their you know you know things have suddenly out of nowhere started shifting and so I think um, yeah it's very important to know that sometimes we can feel that these deities were far removed but like you said he's always there with us and if we wanted and he will always help you out, essentially. So, you know, a very powerful reminder. Just like a parent, right? Always happy to help. <laughs> so, Chati Shakti Prabhu, um, you mentioned um, Ugra Nishinga, mm -hmm. now that Bhakti Swami had a form of, of Ugra Nishinga. Uh, just one thing that really um, came to my mind was that we cannot really have love without there being protection. Because I'm thinking it's, you know, you might think someone loves you and 
there might be you know very sweet exchanges and a lot of affection but if you're in danger and that person then fails to protect you i think you would come to the conclusion that you know there, there was no real love so i find it fascinating that 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 form you know of of the shingadev you know looking so ferocious is actually essential to have a complete you know complete experience of love the mm. protective form um needs to be there and you also um you know you you, you also mentioned about the Rishingadev in in mayapur i think he is probably the most um well known um ugra nishinga in in iskon I, i know that many devotees go to him and they pray for him specifically you know for for different challenges that my face but i've always been curious like why did uh um why did Shri Prabhupada ask the devotees to install like Ugra Nishinga, um, you know, in Mayapur? Because we, we understand why the Panchatattva is there in Mayapur, but why is Lord Nishinga in that specific, like, very ferocious form? Why is he also there? Because I know um, one of the stories I've heard about him is that he is so ferocious um, that the person that was, you know, responsible for um, for carving him um, you know, was told not to go through the the ceremony of um, I think opening up the eyes, but for some reason, or not to carve the eyes yet, mm-hmm. but for some reason he didn't follow um, that instruction, and then he started doing that, and then um, for some reason he, he went away for some time, and when he came back, Lord Nishingadev had demolished his old house; there was nothing left. And then he decided that, you know, he just cannot take it anymore. He put the Shingadev, you know, on a, a back of a truck or some form of transport. And he was driving of Lord Shingadev to Mayapur. And apparently whenever he got to, you know, like a type of a toll gate or border where there has to be some check, then he would stop. And then the guards would see Lord Shingadev at the back and they would just like open the beams and say, go, go, go. <laughs> you know, apparently it was like, you know, he's like, he, he really like, um, he really like, you know, instilled kind of like fear. In many yeah. people's hearts. So why why is he in Mayapur, Dom? <laughs> so as I was saying earlier, you know, actually Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur and Bhaktivano Thakur did had already introduced Nishingadev worship in uh Gaudiya Vaishnavism. But the pastime specifically around Mayapur Dham <clears throat> actually uh, began in 1984. So in 1984, there was an attack uh on the temple, and the Prabhupada deity and the Radharani deity. Uh, were under threat. And so at that point, devotees really said, look, this is now time we need to get Nishingadev here as per Srila Prabhupada's instruction. Because, you know, Mayapur is like our Vatican City. It's it's uh, ISKCON's headquarters. It's only going to expand. And Prabhupada predicted this, that actually Mayapur Dham will expand as Kali Yoga progresses and Vrindavan Dham will kind of condense and shrink. Um, so our experience of connecting with Vrajpakti will become more and more through Mayapur. And the whole world will come and visit there one day, everyone. So we can't afford to be having the deities jeopardized, right? So yes, you're right. Actually, originally, the the original sculptor that they went to refused to carve the Nishinga the deity because Ugra Nishinga doesn't just, you know, there, there's jeopardy essentially for the person who carves him. Um, you know, the family can get sick, you can lose everything. Because actually to worship Ugra Nishingadev, you have to be celibate from birth. And so they tried another five or six. I'm going to give a condensed version of the of the pastime. Anyway, eventually they went back to the original sculptor. And um, the sculptor took the drawings that they had made um, and took them to his guru. And they, you know also used uh, Shastra to modify the image of Nishingadev. And actually his guru said to him, you know, this is Ugra Nishingadev. This is, you know, Ugra Nishingadev coming out of the pillar uh, with Harani Kashapur. And he's like, very, very dangerous. There isn't a, a deity like this being worshipped on this planet at the moment. You know, don't do it. But soon afterwards, he actually got permission. He had a dream. And he called the devotees and said, okay, I'll do it. And he explained to them, it's, my guru came to me in a dream and said, okay, you may proceed and you need to. And he, he made some adjustments in terms of Shastra, based on Shastra, of how it should be carved. And that had to be made from a particular living stone. So living stone, uh, yeah, I don't know the name of the living stone, but essentially the, the way you know that the stone is living is that it makes seven different sounds in seven different places. And there's a specific insect that burrows through it. Um, so there are different ways. You know, Krishna gives... Uh, us everything 
You know, Shastra is his story. It's not just history, it's his story. So he tells us everything that he needs to tell us about himself, how we reach him and who we are, right? Including the things we need to do in this world. So this living stone is from, from Shastra. So to cut a long story short, he told the devotees, I'll be done within six months. After six months, devotees hadn't, you know, heard anything. Um, once he started, though, he was very, very absorbed. They knew this because he wasn't doing anything else except carving this Nishing Liv Deity. And although he was originally very reluctant to do the engraving, uh, he did actually go ahead and do it in the end. So everything we see carved in Nishing Liv's face is done by this sculptor. However, he didn't let the devotees know once he was done. And so a year passed. So by this time, it was... 1990, 1986, so two years later. And the way he ended up actually, um, yes, as you said, the way he ended up actually finally calling the devotees was because the hut that Nishinga there wasn't completely burnt down. And when he went to the hut, everything else immediately around Nishinga there was completely fine. Absolutely fine. And yes, and so as the devotees came to pick up Nishinga there and took him in, you know, they, they had a big truck Two, I think it was a third full of sand for cushioning. And they took it, they, they were able to cross all the boundaries, all the taxes, all the all the legal, you know, bureaucracy that's required to cross those boundaries. And he made it to Mayapur town. But one reassuring thing, you know, is even though he's Ugrinishinga, he has Pralad Maharaj there pacifying him. And also the presiding deity externally and internally of Mayapur Dham is who? Goranga Mahaprabhu, he doesn't accept any offenses. Him and Lord Nityananda are so merciful and soft-hearted and kind. So even though we see externally this form of recognition, I mean, when I look at him, he doesn't look that ferocious to me, to be honest. I have to look really close to see the ugraness, you know, to see the ferocity in him, uh, ferociousness in him. So the external is there for those who don't see his heart. But actually, for the most part, devotees actually experience Goranga's mood. In Lord Nishingadev. Devotees actually really pray to Lord Nishingadev for his compassion and his love and care. So again, back to this, you know, his, his many different sides, his many different faces. Often what we see in a person is based on our vision of them, not necessarily who they are. Yeah, just based on that violence, you know, people, you know, we see these violent depictions and you said, you know, it's important for us to be able to connect that there is a soft, uh, you know, soft, you know, uh, Lord there within that kind of, you know, sharp nails and what have you. So, but how can we appreciate the violent pastime of Nottingham Dave and devotees who pray for the empowerment to pulverize demons? really <laughs> okay i don't want to pulverize the internal demons but if you look at prayers when we when, you know, when we read Shastra, i think there's this um prayer here oh club in the hand of the supreme personality yeah. of godhead you produce sparks of fire as powerful as thunderbolts and you are extremely dear to the lord and so this is the prayer to nishing of this club i am also his servant therefore kindly help me to pound to pieces the evil living beings known as kushmandas venia Vain yakyas, yakshas, rakshasas, boots, and grahas. Please pulverize them. Now, if there's, you know, we as devotees, we don't want to be violent. We don't want to pray for anyone's destruction. But if we have a role in society, in the world, for example, if you're a kshatriya or if you're a parent protecting your children, etc., it's natural. It's actually part of your dharma to invoke a violence. Okay, so this particular prayer isn't necessarily for us, you know. Oh, that person really annoyed me. Can you please pulverize them with your club? You know, <laughs> they're a real demon. I'm not having it, you know. It's not for that type of prayer. If you look at the context of prayers, who's making that prayer? Okay, that this prayer is made by those personalities who have a role in the protection of society. They have a role in the protection of the planet. They have a role in the protection of others. You know, it's the same way during the Mahabharata and particularly the Battle of Kurukshetra. Many prayers are made by both sides uh, for their own protection, but also to destroy others. Not because they're evil or mean, but that's their dharma. Their dharma is to invoke weapons of all types, including divine weapons. So we have to take things in, in context as well. Not all prayers are just at our disposal for just, you know, flicking away that 
person who seems to be an inconvenience to us at this moment in time. <laughs> But it's interesting, though, isn't it? If you look at it, you know, oh, there's these devotees, you know, we focus so much on loving kindness and bhakti, and there's these sweet concepts, and there's this Ugrindar Shimadeva, and, you know, people praying, you know, let me just, you know, praying for the, you're praying to polarize, you know, your enemies, or so it could be really easily misconstrued or misunderstood. So I think it's just really important to set that right because we don't want to be like, oh, there's this form and this is what we pray for, you know? No, no, absolutely. But this is why we want a complete picture of love. You know, on the one hand, we if we only had sweetness and light and nobody protected us, that sweetness and light is not going to last very long. Someone's going to be there to protect the sweetness. Isn't it? A child's mm. innocence, it will be destroyed if parents don't protect that child. Mm. A, a child grows up to be a loving adult because they've been properly protected. So love is complete. Love has, we have to experience it. But yes, you're right. You absolutely must go into a deeper understanding of it and give it context. So just just comes back to why podcasts like this, uh, hearing classes, reading, really being familiar with Srila Prabhupada's books is important because it's very easy in this world of, you know, quotes and sutras and not reading anything else. You know, so many people now tell me they don't listen to classes. They just listen to like a 10-minute podcast, you know, that the guru just put out. And, and a lot of our... our Guru, senior devotees, they're making shorter and shorter videos and classes because people's appetite and attention to these things is becoming smaller and smaller. Everything's becoming much more compact. But it is essential that we try and nourish our minds with a healthy lifestyle and a simple way of living so that we can actually devote more of our mental energy and our time to going deeper with these topics um, rather than just glossing over them on the surface. A quote is easy. It makes gives us a quick feel-good factor, right? But it doesn't really give us any depth. So it's, it's wonderful that you guys are bringing this depth to this particular topic. Thank you so much, Shati Prabhu. I was just thinking, um, um, whenever we feel like offended by someone, I think at that moment we feel like we are Kshatriya. And it's our duty, you know, to chastise it. Like, then it's like, yes, I'm a Kshatriya. <laughs> right. And, and when you're having a philosophical discussion and you think you're right, you suddenly become a Brahmin, right? And you're the Brahmin. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, like, when some cleaning or ma manual labor needs to be done, no one starts thinking, yes, I'm a Shudra. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know. I know, but actually, really, we, we, that's probably the one uh, group of, uh, you know, Vaishnavas in society that we underappreciate and is is absolutely essential. Nothing happens without them. Absolutely. But I, I was also thinking on a more serious note, I was thinking when we see such prayers, um, you know, or like a certain mood, then we should always ask ourselves, like, am I qualified, you know, to make this prayer or to make this request? Because that was that is what you were pointing out. It's like, yes, the prayer is there, but we have to understand who was making the prayer and why they were making it. Mm -hmm. So I think we can always check. Like the, there's nothing wrong with the prayer, but we have to ask ourselves, am I qualified? You know, mm. and is my purpose, is my purpose the proper purpose? So in, in line of that um, topic of, of qualification, of course, an essential character in our most well-known pastime of Lord Shinga is Prahlad Maharaj. And I was always very interested in, you know, how Prahlad Maharaj became Prahlad Maharaj. You also know he's, you know, he's one of the, Mahajans, and we know that um, there is a story in the Hari Bhakti Vilas that explains that you know in a previous life, um, Prahlad Maharaj was a Brahmana, who then became involved with a prostitute, and then he initially, eventually gave up um, his Brahminical activities. But then on the Shingon of Chaturdasi, by providence, um, they both ended up at an abandoned Ashimadev temple, and they got into a quarrel, and because of this quarrel, I mean, I think sometimes if you have a quarrel with your um, with your lover, you get very upset, and they got very upset, it seemed, and then they ended up fasting. And I think they also ended up staying up the whole night. And then it says that because of, you know, them fasting and, um, you know, staying up the whole night on this, you know, in this ruins of an the temple, they accumulated, you know, lots of um, merit. And then for that reason, Prahlad Maharaj, you know, in his next life, became a devotee of Lord Shingadev. But 
I was wondering, does this pastime, you know, this history of Prahlad Maharaj, does it also explain how Prahlad Maharaj developed his faith? Because it's one thing, you know, mm -hmm. fasting, staying up and then becoming a devotee, but it's another thing if we look at him, his faith is unshakable, like there's no moment of doubt ever. And at the same time, he has such compassion for others. So was that also just a result of fasting? And you know, staying up all night in the ruins of a Nishingeti temple. If only it was that easy. <laughs> if only. No, well, you know, the, 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 so the fasting uh, period that he had happened to be Nishinga Chaturdashi. So it happened to be the appearance of Lord Nishinga. And as we know, we fast till twilight, um, at least. Um, and if circumstances also permit, depending on your health condition uh, or stage of life. But actually, with Prahlad Maharaj. His blessings didn't just stop there. That explains why he came into contact with Lord Shingadev. But actually, his pure bhakti, his journey of developing real surrender, started in the womb. When he was in the womb, his uh, mother had been taken into the shelter of Narad Muni. And Narad Muni gave her spiritual shelter as well as physical shelter. He didn't want her and Prahlad Maharaj to get caught up in the crossfire between the demigods and the demons. And whilst he was in the womb, he got to hear all the spiritual instructions and nectar that Narad Muni gave to his mother. And he absorbed this because his consciousness was already leaning towards this. I mean, it's very powerful. If you read the uh, 31st chapter of the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it talks all about the evolution of the fetus in the womb and <clears throat> explains how actually some souls do remember uh, their past lives, and they actually remember the Lord in the womb. Unfortunate, and they make a promise to the Lord. Not every soul, but some souls make a promise to the Lord that I will never forget you. Unfortunately, as they pass through the birth canal, they forget this promise. Because passing through the birth canal is quite a traumatic uh, experience, both for the mother and for the child. And so they forget. But Prahlad Maharaj, whilst he's, you know, in the womb, he's making this prayer, but he's also hearing Krishna Katha. And so it's not just a case of this is an experience in the womb. His consciousness is growing. His love for the Lord is growing. So actually then when he takes birth, it's not enough to be squeezed through the birth canal for him to forget the Lord. And so he always remembers him. And then his, his surrender deepens even further as he's put through his many trials and tribulations. So his heart becomes more soft more surrendered. Why? Because he trusts more. And through that trust, he experiences the Lord's love directly. So it's very different to just the pious credits that we may get from fasting. Trust me to answer, ask a silly question, you know, but you know, Pranad Maharaj, his faith obviously deepened as, you know, Hiranyakashipu was, you know, throwing all sorts at him, poison, the snakes, the fire, but that really only ever increased his faith in the Lord. Whereas us, as you know, or me, for instance, you know, if things go wrong, sometimes it's very easy for us to practice bhakti and to have that faith in the Lord when things are often going right or well, right? But when things start going wrong often, that's when most people think, oh, you know, I've been chanting, doing my rounds, but it's all still going wrong. So how can we as normal aspiring bhakti yogis or trying to follow bhakti, how can we sustain that, you know, faith in the Lord like Prahlad Maharaj did, you know, in Kali Yuga, it's not an easy task. And particularly when things are going wrong, but not all Prahlad Maharaj. So as lay people, how do we sustain that faith in the Lord? You know, it can work um, both ways. Sometimes our having good things in life deepens our faith. Actually, more often, it's when we suffer. That's when we often turn to, to Krishna uh, for protection, shelter, or go and take our rounds, etc. more seriously because we're looking for a solution and we've tried the material ones and they don't work. It's relative and it's different for different people. However, there can come a point in many devotees' life where what they're going through uh, in terms of their human experience feels like so much that they can't quite see Krishna's hand in it. And they can't 
understand or we're stuck with understanding where what is what is in all of this that's actually best for me sometimes however it also is born of the fact that we have expectations that taking to bhakti makes our material life better actually sometimes it can make our material life worse because krishna puts us through the uh, rewards and the consequences that we've got to go through much more quickly much more intensely it's like a crash course so we can surrender quickly and return to him quickly within this lifetime you know but even then Prabhupada says we should be grateful because whatever we're experiencing is still only a shadow of or a token of what we should have experienced I mean if you look at many of us who have come into Krishna consciousness if we were to just look at our adhikar and pious credits we're not really qualified to be allowed to really do what we're doing um, so we've been given some special concession. Um, but even if you're given a special concession, if you're carrying things that you need to go through, that's got to be sped up. There's there's going to be a purging because we may be given something before we're qualified, but that doesn't mean we escape having to qualify ourselves. So I think as devotees, you know, rather than worrying about why am I going through what I'm going through? You know, is it karma? Is it a test? Did I make a mistake? Did I make an offense? The only thing we really have in our control at any moment is how am I going to respond to this? That's actually the core of not just karma, but bhakti. Is that how am I going to respond to any given situation right now? What is the best thing I can do for myself internally and externally, physically, socially, psychologically, and spiritually? that actually this particular experience becomes a catalyst for me to go deeper. And for this, we need devotee association. We can't do this on our own because anybody and everybody knows when we're highly distressed, it's really hard to focus on Shastra and philosophy. It's really hard to hear philosophy. What you need is a kind, loving, non-judgmental experience of a relationship with someone, your friends, your heroes, you know, um, People who are, even people you take care of, we can get a lot of encouragement and love from the people we take care of um, to kind of encourage us and to say, yeah, you know, you're doing well, keep going. You know, a reason to do well, a reason to shine, a reason to be the become the devotee that they see us to be rather than creating a perception of perfection. So this is the secret to bhakti is that let's take shelter of the devotees and see, okay, rather than worrying too much about how I got here, what can I do next? And another thing we see time and time again in Prahlad, not only that he, uh, you know, his faith strengthens the more Hiranyakashipu, you know, tried to kill him, but he was also very compassionate. He didn't retaliate. He just sat there and all he did was praying. So when we, in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, go through hardships, what can we do to practice compassion without praying victim to false forgiveness? You know, we mm. see people all the time I'm saying, oh, I forgive you, but two minutes later, you're just, you know, people trying to do everything to sabotage somebody behind their back. So how can we really surrender and actually practice that actual forgiveness whereby when hardships come, particularly those, you know, because of somebody else's doing, how can we actually practice that true forgiveness like Prahlad did? It's a nice question. Um... So this term qualification came up, adhikar. Adhikar is also another way of looking at where am I at? Where am I at now? Because bhakti is a journey. Uh, pure devotional service is a journey. And taking the humble position often means just being off, honest about where we're at now. Prahlad Maharaj was a pure devotee. So his forgiveness, his compassion was spontaneous. It was natural. It was a kind of compassion and um, Forgiveness that is natural and inherent in all of us as we become more and more, uh, become our natural state. But in the journey to getting to that natural state of pure forgiveness and compassion, where our trust and experience of our relationship with Krishna is so deep that we really do experience the body and, and mind as a passing dream, as a temporary chapter, as a fleeting visit, 
until we get, because you don't worry too much about what happened in your dream. You wake up, you're fine. Oh, I'm going to wake up in a few minutes. Sometimes you even wake yourself up like, oh, I'm really not into this dream. I'm getting up. You know, we do that, right? So this is what he did in these prayers. He's like, this is what's going on around me. It's not really what my life is about. And he would go internal in his relationship with the Lord. So we have to be honest with ourselves about where we're at. Forgiveness is essential for everybody. Um, and most essential for ourselves because the opposite of forgiveness is holding on to resentment. Resentment really is we're waiting for the person who hurt us to be punished. Now, when we trust the people protecting us to do their job, if someone hurts us, you don't worry about punishing them. You know they'll be taken care of. Okay, that So we don't waste time hurting ourselves by reliving that trauma, reliving that experience, holding on to re resentment and being very attached to being invested in seeing that other person get their just desserts. So there's a, there's a wisdom and a self-care in being for, forgiving and a self because ultimately it benefits us. Of course, when you're very advanced, it protects other people if you forgive. Uh, and this is this is Prahlad Maharaj's case. He knows the Lord loves him so much. If he doesn't forgive, if he's not compassionate, the Lord will tear them up. He will tear them up. It's like the pastime of Haridas Thakur. When he's beat, being beaten in 20 marketplaces, he knows in his heart that what they're doing is not really, they're not acting. They're acting on instruction. Um, they're acting just with the body and the mind. It's not who they are. He is body will feel the pain of the whips and the sticks. But he also knows that Lord Chaitanya loves him. And Lord Chaitanya would do anything to protect him. And because he knows, but he has love and compassion for even those who are beating him in the marketplace, he's able to pray for them. There's a really, really beautiful, the whole pastime is really beautiful. But actually, they're shocked that he can survive 20 marketplaces of being beaten. Most people collapse after two. He's beaten and there isn't anything on him. And there isn't a mark on him. But when he goes to visit Lord Chaitanya, when Lord Chaitanya's chadar drops, he sees that there's stick marks and whip marks on his body. And Lord Chaitanya explains to him that I wanted to protect you. I wanted to destroy those who are hurting you. But you just kept praying to me to forgive them. And so you disabled me from doing anything to them. The only thing I could do was simply place my body upon yours. Now, this requires a real level of surrender. But until we reach that level, we can practice forgiveness. Because we know we've really forgiven when we think of that person and we no longer feel angry or upset. But that doesn't mean we never feel angry or upset. Part of forgiveness means first you connect with the anger and upset, acknowledge the pain they've caused you, and then actually make a prayer to say, I no longer want to be invested in seeing the outcome of whether you get your just desserts or not. I, I'm forgiving you. Things will be taken care of. And I hope you change. And this can even be done internally because when we forgive, we actually empower the other person. What does empowerment mean? Sometimes it just means giving that person breathing space to change because as we lock them into our consciousness and we relive that trauma over and over again, we also invite them into that trauma because subtly we're pulling them back in that scenario. So even though they're not physically doing anything to us, we're, we're taking a piece of their subtle body, making them relive that reality we had with them for a temporary um, moment or weeks or months or years, however long it went on. We forgive them. They're no longer in our subtle space. They can't hurt us and they're actually free to possibly change. No, thank you. That was very beautiful. I read somewhere, forgiveness is the gift you give to yourself. So I think yeah. that's what people forget. People often think, you know, the, the gift they give to themselves is seeing that person being punished. But often, like you said, what happens is then we are just reliving that trauma and nobody's free to kind of frankly move on. So no, that, thank you. That was a very beautiful uh, elaboration. Thank you. Um, Shakti Prabhu, one, um, one thing that came to my mind while you were speaking is that there's this direct correlation between the depth of our connection with Krishna and our ability to um, forgive. And I was also thinking, and it really ties in well with, you know, the whole mood of Lord Shingadev, the safer we feel and the more protected that we feel, the easier we can forgive. Because if you are feeling threatened, if you are feeling scared, if you are feeling there's no one there for you, then 
you know, to forgive is so much more challenging. So the more we are aware of this protection that we have of the Lord, I think the more that enables us, you know, to, um, of course, after acknowledging what has happened, but to actually have that ability uh, to to forgive. Yeah, no, absolutely. This, uh, If we can't see Krishna's loving hand in our life, then it becomes difficult to feel safe. Um, I think we opened with this, that, you know, pain is less painful when we see the intention of mm -hmm. the person behind the pain, the deliverer of the pain. You know, mm -hmm. I think some of us were speaking about this the other day. You know, you go to a surgeon, they cut, they quite literally cut your body open to remove mm -hmm. things. But you surrender to them because you trust them and you surrender to the pain. The pain becomes not just easy to tolerate, but you feel a sense of happiness and relief. This pain is giving me relief. Imagine that, you know, uh, and even little things like a splinter in your finger. We've all had our mother or father come to us with a safety pin or tweezers to pull that splinter out. And they often have to cause more pain to remove mm. the splinter than the splinter is causing itself. But not only do we tolerate that, we're grateful for that pain. Because we know that that pain is ultimately removing something more toxic. Mm. So, but this also comes with time. This is why bhakti, you know, bhakti is a relationship. We're in a relationship with Krishna. We're in a relationship with devotees. You give up on any relationship too quickly, you never get to see the whole person. You never do. Mm. But if you stick with the relationship, then over time you'll see how Krishna's come through in so many ways. Mm. And so we mm. then develop the trust in Krishna. Mm. And it happens spontaneously because he's been mm. through so many other times for us. So this um, just brought back to me something that which you said a little while ago. You were mentioning how Prahlad Maharaj um, did obtain many pious credits, you know, for fasting, even though it was unknowingly, you know, on a Shingar of Chaturdasi on that um, the ruins of the temple. But you were explaining, and I've never actually heard this perspective before, that it's actually through the whole pastime that he's deepening his faith. Because sometimes we get the impression that he was just born and he was just immediately like, you know, completely um, the saint. But then it's, you know, you're explaining he was gradually actually building the faith, building the faith. And then at the end, the Dev appears to him. So I find this, you know, this journey that he goes through very interesting. But there's another character which, you know, in his story, which we don't hear much about. And I find this a common theme. We have this, you know, prostitute that he had... Um, a relationship with and we, we have a similar um, situation where there's a prostitute of, with whom Bivala Mangala Thakur also you know had a relationship with and even there's a prostitute for Arida Thakur and usually the story goes you know they come into contact and then somehow there's a transformation they become a devotee and it's, then it's kind of they ha lived happily ever after we don't hear so much you know but what happens more with this you know with these prostitutes and I, I'm fascinated by it you know like what is the, the rest of the story? Because their story kind of ends there. They just, you know, they become devotees and then they live happily ever after. But what I'm particularly curious about this prostitute is she and Prahlad Maharaj did exactly the same thing. They fought, then they fasted. <laughs> but, in, but in the next lifetime, you know, she becomes an Apsara in the heavenly planets. And then it's said that she enjoys there. And then she goes to Vishnu's supreme abode. So do we have any insight into why, you know, they have different paths back to God? It Like she goes to the heavenly planets while Prahlad Maharaj, he gets born into the family of demons. Hmm. And then he goes through many trials. So do you have any insight? Yeah. So we are the, the So actually, Lord Nishingadev answers this question uh, for Pr Prahlad Maharaj. You know, uh, he actually explains to him that, he puts him through all of that to use him as an example and to propagate devotional service. There's a difference between liberation and there's different types of liberation. Even when we achieve Vishnu's abode, um, Prema is different because perfection is not finite. Perfection is unlimited. And we forget this. So that's why Prahlad Maharaj's journey, he continues to deepen his love. And Lord Nishingadev uses him as an example uh, to actually show uh, what it is that a devotee goes through and can go through and how the Lord comes through. I mean, look at Prahlad Maharaj's prayers. We've got so much. We've got our nine prayers of devotional service from Prahlad Maharaj's prayers, uh, which have now, you know, been handed to us to be able to connect. So 
uh, the purpose is different. The Lord uses his devotees in different ways and the destination is different. It's not the same thing to go to the heavenly planets and achieve Vishnu's supreme abode versus having pure devotional service. They're very different. Where one is completely... Yeah, so the end result that they both achieve different. She, um, she, she attained some form of liberation but Malad Maharaj achieved pure devotional service and he became a Mahajan. Yeah. Yes. The destination. So it's not just about the fasting. You know, mm. it's what happened next. And we know because of Prahlad Maharaj's contact with Naradmani, hearing uh, about pure devotional service, um, hearing the Vedas, and then actually applying it. We hear so much. How much do we apply? He still had a choice. He didn't mm. have to apply. He could have caved to Hiranyakashipu's threats at any time, but he. Mm. And it's we may have an adhikar, but it's up to us whether we apply the adhikar, right? You may have the qualification to be a multi-millionaire, but if you choose not to connect with it, it's not going to happen, right? So, uh, choice is always there. How much have we all heard? How much do we apply? You know, we look across the Bhagavatam. And different Vaishnavas had have heard different amounts before they surrender. You know, Parikshit Maharaj listens for seven days and he surrenders. Arjun listens for 45 minutes and he surrenders. Katvanga listens for a moment. In a moment, he surrenders. You know, he's 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 asking, he's finished fighting, and he now wants to dedicate his life to the Lord. He says, How much time before I leave my body? I want to now surrender to my Lord. He was told, You have one moment. He just surrenders in that one moment. Thank you so much for just yeah, illuminating that topic further. So, in in conclusion, I, I find this you know this fascinating as well. I kind of seen the um, you know, just manifesting so many places. We didn't get to that, but there's also you know Lord Chaitanya, you know, praying to um, Lord Jagannath in Jagannath Puri, and then he recites some prayers to Nishingadev. So that, that would have been a whole other topic. But then also in the Bhagavatam, there is a reference in the in the fifth canto that there is a planet for Nishingadev, you know, um, called Hari Varsha, and there the residents of that planet are led by Prahlad Maharaj in worship of Lord Nishingadev. And then what is fascinating is that they worship Lord Nishingadev to obtain his devotional service. So the question that came to my mind was like, why are the residents praying for what they have already seemed to have obtained? Because they are on Lord Nishingadev's planet. They're already in the spiritual world. So they're worshipping him, you know, for service. When you were asking that question, I was thinking, well, we chant Hare Krishna, even though we're actually already engaged in devotional service. We're asking for pure devotional service. So... Um, this is a beauty of, this is what I mean by perfection is not finite. Perfection is unlimited because love is unlimited. So when we love someone, even if we have them, actually we really, for that relationship to go deeper, we have to remain eternally grateful. Relationships break down when we become over familiar, when we think we've already got it and we're no longer, then that just breeds uh, a lack of gratitude and then that breeds some contempt. You know, so and pride comes in also. So this prayer that please keep us engaged in your devotional service is born of gratitude. It's not born of a lack of knowledge or a lack of having, but they have. So they're grateful. They're grateful. You know, in the 10th uh, canto in the 29th chapter, when the gopis meet Krishna, why does he disappear? Because they're feeling special in his company. They become proud of feeling special. So he goes away to remind them that just because you have me, it doesn't mean you own me. Mm. So that's why they pray. They're grateful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Prabhu. That really reminds me that in in in, you know, in bhakti, it's like what I think make, which makes it um, unique. 
And what also makes it very significant is that if what someone would ask, like, you know, why are you, you know, doing all these things? Why are you, you know, singing to the deities? Why are you cooking for the deities? Why are you dancing for the deities? This year, everything that we are doing, they would say, like, what is your motive? And, you know, what is your goal? And it's that, there, you know, that is the goal. The goal is just to, you know, to express your love. There is, like, there is no ulterior motive, ultimately. Anna Lloyd, uninterrupted mm. devotional service. Mm. It, takes, it takes time and investment of intention. Mm. You know, it's not a passive process. Mm. Um, but then even when, once you get that, that pure Anna Lloyd devotional service, even then it's so sweet that you want more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're insatiable for pure love, right? <laughs> Our appetite is insatiable. But even though, and it's, this is the thing about spiritual life, it's so many things are inconceivable. Spiritual life, Krishna's love is the most satisfying, and yet we're insatiable. Like, how does that work? <laughs> that, that's definitely spiritual, because it makes no sense on the material platform that the most satisfying thing, you once you get it, you're hankering for more. So I'm conscious of time, and I think... All of our listeners have definitely appreciated our session. We've, we've seen in the comments, people have said um, that there's there's been a lot of things that they've heard for the first time and there's a lot that they are going to think about and reflect about. For me, certainly, it was an opportunity to meditate you know, much deeper than I usually do um, on the Shingadev. So I'm very grateful to Shakti that you gave us your, your time and your presence and um, your realizations. Is there anything you would like to share with us um, in closing? Um, no, nothing else. I think we've talked about so many things. Um, but one thing I do want to share is that, you know, exploring different avatars and manifestations of Krishna um, is a real pleasurable uh, part of spiritual life. But we shouldn't feel pressure that we must worship every single form uh, because there's so many different faces of, of Lord Krishna and so many different manifestations. Um, love and attraction is natural. We can't develop love and attraction for someone we don't know about. So it is important to hear about the different manifestations. But if you don't have a natural attraction, even after hearing and reading, it doesn't make you a bad devotee. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so, so go here, read, chant, and then follow your heart. Thank you so much. It's been so nice being with both of you and to our listeners. And thank you for giving me an opportunity also to reflect more deeply on, on Lord Nishingadev. And there's so much more. I know we didn't cover everything, um, but, you know, there's, there's so much out there now. We're really blessed with uh, having many devotees making much more available in terms of pastimes and uh, things which are, you know, Pastimes we hear from other temples, ISKCON temples, non-ISKCON temples, because the worship of Lord Nishingadev has been around for a really long time, since, since Satyuk, which is a really, really long time. You know, uh, we're looking at billions of years. So, um, yeah, thank you so much once again. I feel honoured to have been part of this programme with you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. And we know you're a very busy lady. And thank you so much for very uh, generously giving our time. And, you know, like you mentioned, we covered so many depths in terms of because, you know, we all, always just see that ferocious nature of Lord Nsimha. And also we looked at how we can actually connect to Lord Nsimha more. And I, I, I'm going to personally take away, you know, if I'm struggling to chant or, you know, it's never occurred to me to kind of pray to Lord Nsimha, you know, I've always just, you know, tried to connect with the holy name and uh you know but it's never occurred to me so personally you know as a kind of practical lesson i will certainly take that um uh, you know next time i'm chanting or uh, coming through any obstacles but thank you very much everybody thank for joining us today and uh we will uh post on details about our next session uh which will be in june uh with garunda prabhu who will make another appearance and uh please do tune in uh on the 6th of june but we will share more information later uh, on the facebook uh and our YouTube channels but thank you very much everybody for joining us uh 
and giving your time to us so general sleep uh, particularly to Shakti Prabhu it's always a pleasure to have you and I always learn so much from you and I'm sure and I hope that our listeners at home also uh, took some nuggets of wisdom we covered lots uh, but I hope somebody took something everyone sorry everybody took something practical from the session today thank you very much everybody have a lovely rest of the evening Hare Krishna